Silent Neolithic Seas, Rhymes and Riddles of the Ancient Mariners. Today we will discuss Neolithic nautical engineering and the ancient physics of seafaring, drawing on two sources of information. A. Prehistory nautical imagery, illustrations of seafaring, as portrayed in the art and architecture of ancient maritime cultures. And B. Hydroglyphics, Decoding Ancient Depictions of Hydrodynamic Phenomena. We will discuss evidence for three intersecting concepts. The first, boat-shaped tombs, known as naviform tombs. Second, naviform motifs, depictions of boats and their parts, as well as their boat wakes. And third, quote, hydroglyphics, a term to reflect the pictorial depiction of hydrodynamic phenomena such as whirlpools, upwellings, and the wake patterns of moving boats. Why study ancient hydroglyphics? The answer is clues. Clues to understand the thought patterns of ancient mariners, particularly in times of change such as the third millennium BCE, 3000 to 2000 BCE. During this time, there was a rise and spread of shared solar cosmologies. And these illustrate long-range impacts of trade networks and perhaps travel as well. Recently, the British Museum assembled an exhibit called The World of Stonehenge. Concepts of the cosmos and the world of Stonehenge were discussed. Through this talk, we will examine some of the artifacts that were exhibited in the world of Stonehenge. These include two Neolithic chalk drums, which were placed in the graves of children. These chalk drums have possible naviform and solar motifs carved into them. One of these motifs, a set of nested lozenges, appears hundreds of years later in a gold medallion which was buried with a high-ranking individual near Stonehenge. It is believed that this gold medallion represents the sun. During the next 20 minutes, I will discuss the iconography of water and boats in 15 archaeological sites which lie along the Atlantic facade, covering a period from the late Pleistocene through the Bronze Age. In these discussions, I will utilize red asterisks to illustrate hypotheses to clearly distinguish them from established archaeological facts. Let us begin with a discussion of ancient nautical engineering, as seen in the ancient iconography of boats and prehistory seas. Before discussing naviform tombs, it is very useful to understand the construction of umiaks, which are an ancient form of skin on frame boats. Umiaks have a key structural feature known as a keelson, a long longitudinal axial spar which provides the umiak with major longitudinal stability, allowing it to withstand large wave actions in open seas. Here is an example of a naviform motif which exhibits evidence of a keelson. This naviform motif was carved during the third millennium in a tomb located in France at the Gulf of Morbihan. This is during the time period of the construction of Stonehenge. In addition to the keelson, the motif illustrates the ribs of a boat, as well as a possible notch for a sculling oar. Overall, this naviform motif illustrates an advancing form of naval architecture taking place in the third millennium, involving a more ancient form of an axial keelson. Umiaks with their axial keelson construction are capable of carrying multi-ton loads and crews and passengers between 20 and 30 people. In Greenland, horned umiaks were used to hunt sea mammals, including large whales. The horns are extensions of the gunnels. These protrusions of the gunnels allow lifting of the umiak to land it or to launch it. Platforms in fore and aft for steering and harpooning 
as well as sites for attachments of cordage, such as lines attached to prey. In the upper part of the image, one sees a chain of umiaks towing a dead whale to shore. Umiaks are thought to have been crucial for the peopling of the Arctic. In addition, it is now thought that skin boats were likely used to people the Americas during the last glaciation. That time period has now been moved back to between 20 and 40,000 years ago, based on recent discovery of footprints and mammoth kills in the state of New Mexico. This plot shows a distribution of skin boats in prehistoric and historical times. The peopling of Greenland was comparatively a recent event. In general, skin and bark boats have helped Homo sapiens move around the world during the last 80,000 years. This concept provides some of the backstory to understand the peopling of Northern Europe during the Mesolithic and later the Neolithic time periods. However, it is necessary to look to the iconography of the Neolithic and Bronze Ages to obtain more detailed understanding of the type of boats that were used by these maritime peoples. Important clues to the shape of these boats can be obtained by examining stones and other artifacts that were displayed in the recent World of Stonehenge exhibition at the British Museum. On the upper left is a set of stones from the Ness of Brudgar, including an engraved stone which was excavated from the base of a structure known as the cathedral. On this stone is a set of waveform motifs, which are wave-like in character. They resemble the Kelvin wake of a traveling elongated boat. We will discuss these particular motifs in detail shortly. On the right is the Nebra Sky Disc, also displayed at the World of Stonehenge exhibition from 1600 BCE. Besides the solar and lunar motifs, in the lower portion of the disc is an arc. It has been postulated to be either an inverted rainbow or a celestial coracle. Coracles are an important type of boat to discuss, especially with respect to funerary practices. Several examples of coracles being used as coffins have been reported in the archaeological literature. The shape of one of these funerary coracles is closely matched to historical examples of coracles throughout Britain. These same coracles can be compared to heel-shaped cairns in northern Scotland, Caithness, as well as in the Shetland Islands. And again, there is a strong morphological correspondence between these watercraft and these funerary monuments. I encourage viewers at this presentation to visit the Boyne Curragh Heritage Group in Ireland a world center for the reconstruction of Neolithic watercraft, curacs and coracles. The analysis of naviform and waveform motifs in Neolithic monuments is an active and exciting area of archaeological research. This recent review by Serge Kaysen and colleagues highlights the following points. A. Naviform tombs are present in Neolithic Brittany, Bronze Age Balearic Islands, as well as Iron Age Scandinavia. B. Naviform motifs were used in the 5th millennium in Brittany. C. Astronomical and naviform motifs were sometimes juxtaposed in Neolithic monuments. I encourage viewers of this presentation to consult these references for a broader set of information about Neolithic art and architecture, Neolithic cosmologies, as well as prehistory, naval architecture, and journeys. We will now examine the form and function of Neolithic watercraft, drawing on the morphological features of Neolithic naviform tombs 
and Neolithic naviform motifs. On the right is a Neolithic megalith known as the St. Samson Stella in Northern Brittany, 70 tons, 10 meters in height. On it are a set of motifs depicting boats, sailing ships. Frequently, the masts appear to have a curving mast head. In later centuries, Egyptian cargo ships also utilize such a curving masthead. The purpose of it is to suspend a mobile sail, allowing it to pivot easily with changing wind directions. A curving masthead may have also facilitated the safety of an observer sitting on the yard or yard arm in complex seas, dirty weather, navigating through complex coastlines the precursor to the later crow's nest. Turning now to the long horned cairns of northern Scotland, Caithness and Orkney. On the left is the long gray cairn of Campster, which has four protruding horns. From an aerial view, this closely matches the aspect ratios and morphological features of horned umiaks, which are found in Greenland as well as Alaska. Are there other morphological features that correspond between these cairns and boats? Are they actually naviform? One of these cairns is located in the Isle of Westray, the northwestern part of the Orkney archipelago. The point of cut Neolithic Horn Cairn of Westray. This is a quote from the final report on the excavation of the Point of Cut Horn Cairn. The external sidewalls curved inwards as they rose, giving the Finnish core cairn something of the appearance of an unturned boat. An artist's rendering of the excavated stones of the Point of Cut Horn Cairn shows an axial element which closely resembles that of the axial keelson on a horned umiak. Assuming that the horned cairns of Orkney and Caithness are naviform in shape, what funerary significance does a boat have for these people? Numerous cultures have conceived that boats delivered deceased souls to the afterlife, either to the underworld or to the heavens. The journey to the afterlife and boats for the dead were represented in Greek and Roman cultures. Charon served as the ferryman to the afterlife. Are umiaks and coracles for the dead being represented in the naviform funerary monuments that are prevalent in Northern Scotland, Orkney, and Shetland. Elsewhere in Britain, naviform tombs are present. In Southern England, in the first half of the fourth millennium, the Hazelton North Cairn, as well as the Ascot under Witchwood Long Barrow, show a prominent Keelson motif, as well as what appear to be lateral ribs again suggesting that these are naviform tombs, and in the case of the Hazelton North Cairn, the world's oldest family tree has been reconstructed from five generations of bones that were deposited in these passage tombs. A letter from Doggerland, mapping a vanished landscape. What evidence is there of horned umiaks along the Atlantic facade in prehistory times. It's important to emphasize that the hydrology of prehistory Europe has radically changed and continues to change. These are impacts of climate change. Recently has been published that a Mesolithic horned umiak carving is present on a stone face in northern Norway. This is now thought to be one of the earliest carvings 
of an umiak anywhere in the world, 10,000 years before current time. And yet this motif is superseded by motifs that are found in the late Pleistocene caves of the Cantabria Mountains in northern Spain. These are Pleistocene naviform paintings in caves such as the Altamira Cave, as well as a cave known as El Castillo. And these span time scales of about 20,000 to 13,000 years before present. So nautical science involves invention, innovation, and inheritance. And the importance of archiving nautical information is to transmit it to subsequent generations. Transmitting nautical concepts involves collecting, condensing, and communicating specific types of information. This would include how to make waterproof lashings from spruce roots by splitting the roots and boiling them and using them to wrap gunnels and to stitch pieces of bark together. This is the type of nautical information that I am receiving from viewing these motifs. Before returning to a discussion of Neolithic naval architecture, I would like to comment briefly on the artistic representations of boats using a gallery of motifs concentrating on morphological features such as the curvature of the hull, which is known as the rocker. Ra moves through the heavens on a solar bark represented here in a, with a boat of high rocker. At night, he changed boats to a night boat also in this painting with high rocker. Moving on a river represented here with hydroglyphics. Below this is an ice age painting, presumably of an ice age boat, this is a hypothesis, floating on water represented here as a line of dots. Is it possible to represent a concept using both realism and abstraction in the same painting? Yes, in the foreground, realism, and the background, abstraction. Let us now compare the hybridized boat motif from the Pleistocene with a boat motif from the Neolithic on the St. Samson Stella, which we discussed before. Note that the boat motif with high rocker as similar morphological features to a gondola in modern Venice. Consider again the issues of realism versus abstraction. Neighbor form motifs. Stitched bark and stitched skin boats of prehistory Europe. Both of these types of boats allowed the northward migrations of peoples during the Paleolithic, Mesolithic, and Neolithic times. These issues are outlined in this compendium, The Bark Canoes and Skin Boats of Northern Eurasia, which describes the diversification of these watercraft during prehistory and historical times. I would also like to recommend this following recent review. Neolithic seafaring and maritime technologies shaped a new world of megalithic societies. Seas as a part of a shared cosmology. We have discussed naviform tombs, naviform motifs. In the final portion of this presentation, we will discuss three examples of Neolithic hydroglyphics. The first story involves the Ness of Brodgar, the most incredible piece of Neolithic decoration found on the site. This refers to a carved stone decorated with numerous V-shaped waveform motifs. These motifs closely resemble the V-shaped wakes that follow traveling boats. This carved stone was deposited at the southwest buttress of Structure 10 at the Nessa Bradyar. This structure is also known as the Cathedral. 
How can this stone be analyzed? Do these triangular patterns represent the depictions of Kelvin wakes? Which is the term used to describe boat wakes, named after the Scottish physicist Lord Kelvin, who first described the linear physics that gives rise to these wakes behind traveling boats. However, Kelvin wakes also have nonlinear elements, which require computers and computational methods to solve. There is a reference to these calculations in the lower right. If you analyze geometrically the angles of these motifs, they closely correspond to the Kelvin wake angle, which is approximately 39 degrees. These patterns fit the concept of Kelvin wakes from geometric, physical, fluid mechanics standpoints, but do they correspond to Kelvin wakes when viewed from an artistic or archaeological perspective? Knowing your boat means knowing its wake. Wake patterns depend on boat shape, boat speed, and depth of water. These factors would have been known to ancient mariners. Perhaps they collated this information and had it archived on this special stone. If you are a wakeboarder or a water skier, you will recognize the wake pattern of a fast-moving boat over on the right. What type of boats could have made fast-moving wakes in the Neolithic? Outriggers. On the opposite side of the seafaring stone is this tripartite motif, which I interpret to be a possible outrigger, a sailing outrigger. Above that is a triac, a modern modified kayak with outriggers, which are a very speedy type of sailboat. In the Neolithic, a dugout canoe could be fitted with outriggers and adding a sail. This was done by a man in Australia, and this YouTube illustrates its seaworthiness. To make an even faster boat, young ancient mariners who were studying nautical engineering at the Academy of Brodgar in the Ness could have asked their instructors to import high-quality bark from Britain to manufacture bark canoes. Take these boats add outriggers, sail, grease the hull with pig grease or cow grease, then take the boat to Loch Stennis and sail it in a 40 mile an hour westerly wind. What type of speeds would be expected? Perhaps as high as 10 knots. At this speed, the bark canoe with its outrigger likely to make wake patterns that resemble those displayed on the seafaring stone. Moving to the second topic of hydroglyphics, celestial symbols and boat motifs. Moon motifs have been found on carved stones in Orkney, Brittany, and Ireland. These similar moon motifs are sometimes juxtaposed or placed within neighbor form motifs, such as B, from the Gulf of Morbihan, the pure Desplats Dolmen, which we've discussed before. In this neighbor form motif, you see motifs for the full moon as well as the crescent moon. Does this represent the concept of a celestial boat moving the moon through the night sky? In the third millennium in Samaria, Sumerians had a god, Nana, which was believed to move through the night sky in a lunar boat. Let's take that concept to Northern Ireland and look at the rear stone, the highly decorated rear stone of the Carrochiel Cairn T. This passage tomb receives illumination at the equinoxes. Light passes through a light box and illuminates these motifs, which include numerous celestial motifs, a waveform motif in the upper portion of the stone, and several naviform motifs. Comparing these motifs, these neighborform motifs, to one that we discussed earlier from the Gulf of Morbihan, one sees a similar Kielsen motif as well as rib motifs. Are these evidence of a shared cosmological belief 
that boats are vehicles for celestial objects in the night sky. Now moving to the final topic of Neolithic hydroglyphics, the Newgrange Passage Tomb, Entrance Stone, which is considered to be one of the finest examples of Neolithic art, is a story being told in this stone, a story of vortices and upwellings, essentially a story of a whirlpool complex. Let us briefly compare these motifs to the dynamics of a whirlpool complex. Once again, vortices, overflows, upwellings. Note that the upwellings are an area of clear water where the water is rising up and spreading laterally. There's evidence of that in these nested chevrons. Is this a dynamical map of the Cory Vrecken Whirlpool Complex. Cory Vrecken is a strait between two islands in the Inner Hebrides, which we will discuss in a moment. The goal for the Cory Vrecken has very extreme hydrodynamics. Strong tidal flows, whirlpools, upwellings, overflows, and standing waves, many of them which could conceivably correspond to these dynamics. We will also draw on the drawings of Leonardo da Vinci, who studied whirlpool complexes in his laboratory. And the concept of vortex splitting, which is illustrated in this diagram. In the next two slides, I will briefly discuss a hypothesis that the Newgrange entrance stone represents a hydrographic tablet illustrating two phases of a tidal cycle in the Gulf of the Cory Vrecken. On the left portion of the stone would be the vortices generated during the flood tide, where water is flowing out into the Atlantic. On the right side of the stone would represent the ebb tide dynamics, taking place when water is flowing from the Atlantic into the Irish Sea. As tidal flows flow past Scarborough, they interact with an underwater rock pinnacle which is the source of these vortices. If one looks at the entrance stone, one sees a change in chirality. The vortices on the left portion of the stone are turning in the clockwise direction, whereas on the right, they're turning in the counterclockwise direction. These dynamics are clearly demarcated by a linear line, suggesting a change in space and time. One can see these dynamics with drones flying over the Cory Vrecken. Below is the ebb tide dynamics. Such dynamics were first characterized by Leonardo da Vinci with water flowing by a obstacle. Here is a cross-sectional view, not to scale, but showing the dynamics of water on the ebb flow interacting with the pinnacle. I've added da Vinci's diagrams of a vortex stream coming to the surface and producing the ebb vortices, which are seen in the drone images. Besides vortices, there are numerous upwellings, which may, may correspond to the chevrons, the spreading chevrons or lozenges in the Newgrange entrance stone. This is another view of the vortices and upwellings in the ebb tide, which is moving towards the Irish Sea. These dynamics would be especially prominent with low angle light illumination, which would occur during the sunrise, the dawn of the winter solstice. Light rays passing over Jura would intersect a rocky ridge on the Isle of Scarba producing a distinctive shadow beyond it. Observers in the shadow would still be able to view the whirlpool dynamics and the forward scatter from these illuminating light rays would create a very dramatic illumination of the whirlpool complex. 
Neolithic pilgrims and artists may have positioned themselves at this vista point to view both the ebb tide dynamics as well as the flood tide dynamics. This brings up a question whether the New Grange passage tomb was specifically designed to replicate the winter solstice illumination of the Cori Vrecken as well as the Isle of Scarpa. In concluding, we have examined the following key concepts of, and implications. Nautical engineering. We've discussed the age of Kielsons from before 20,000 BCE to the present. Using this concept, it is possible to analyze prehistory, neighbor form, art, and architecture, examining these monuments and motifs for evidence of a Kielsen or other structural parts of a boat. This helps place the monument or motif within a certain archaeological context, such as a funerary boat or a technical diagram, which is being used for educational purposes. A similar approach can be used to analyze Neolithic hydroglyphics, which are hydrodynamic symbolics. A set of hydrodynamic symbolics seems to have been used by these maritime cultures to tell stories. We have discussed, for instance, the New Grange entrance tomb, whether it expresses the story of the Cori Vrecken whirlpool complex at different phases of its tidal cycle. Another example is the concept of a boat with its trailing wake, which may be expressed in the Fulton drum, shown in the center of this montage. This combination of a boat plus its trailing wake may correspond to the motif seen here in this Bronze Age razor, which appears to have a elongated tapered boat motif followed by a flaring wake. The depiction of celestial objects such as the sun or maritime objects such as waves, boats, and their wakes may have been conserved for hundreds of years among maritime cultures. How do regional similarities among neighborform tombs or neighborform motifs, as well as regional similarities in hydroglyphics, alter our views of what was occurring in the Neolithic among maritime cultures? Do these tombs reflect the regional use of certain types of boats, horned umiaks, coracles, kuroks? Did regional expressions of hydroglyphics serve as a means of establishing and reinforcing regional identities? Calvin wakes at the Ness, quadrupolar vortices on the Isle of Westray, tripolar vortices at Newgrange. Perhaps all of these hydroglyphics are sacred symbols of the sea, reflecting a variation on a theme, an integrated cosmology that interlinks the earth, the seas, and the sky. May the Kelvin Wake be with you. Archaeologists recognize Brittany as the launch point for the Neolithic colonization of Britain, Ireland, Orkney, and Shetland. What role did boats, wakes, and hydroglyphics play in this maritime culture? One can visit the Table des Marchands Dolmen in the Gulf of Morbihan and view the rear stone of this passage tomb. It is covered with elaborate hydroglyphics which closely resemble the Kelvin Wake. What better way to evaluate this comparison than to compare the 6,000-year-old carving to an aerial drone shot of a Kelvin wake being formed? What type of interactions did ancient mariners have with this particular stone, with this display of a putative Kelvin wake? Did they offer prayers to receive some expected outcome? For instance, were they seeking a smooth sailing? Perhaps it is possible to translate that concept 
into the following idiom. May the sea forces be with you.